There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to the Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. He's been in multiple international productions of Cats, performing as Pounceful, Corporate Cat, and Skimble Shanks. So welcome, Darren Tower, and thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you here. I This interaction started with you saying, <laughs> I thought Skimble should be picked for two plus years, three plus years. And so I always love going in thinking... All right, I got someone on my side to start. Um, so, so I'm excited to have you come in and give the Skimble take and then the Darren take. Yeah. Well, I mean, Skimble builds a bloody train every night. Yeah. Like, he builds every a night. train. A train. What screws do? So let's minutes. start. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> let's start in the beginning. I, I always love to yeah. hear about your experience kind of learning about the show. So you started um, on tour in 2003-ish, so you would have had yeah. the 98 movie potentially mm. to, at your disposal, but what was your first introduction to Cats? So, I'm, like, I'm aging myself here, but I <laughs> uh, saw the original Australian production. I, it's, uh, I'm in Melbourne. It started in Sydney in, um, I think, 2000, oh, sorry, 1985, and it came to Melbourne in 1987. So... Um, at that time, my whole family would go see shows, and and I've got two older sisters, and I have and my my dad's now past my mum and dad, but aunties and uncles, cousins, like there would be heaps of it, and we went. To, I would have been eleven. We went to see the show, and I was mesmerised. I ate it up. I was like, oh my god, there are cats coming at me, and and I was like, oh, we're going to be going to see this over and over again. This is going to be awesome. And at the end of the show, 40 of my family all hated it, hated it. <laughs> my dad hated it so much that he said he was never going to go see a show again, and he didn't until I my first show in 1998. But um, I just loved it. It was the first show I ever auditioned for when I was 16. And uh, I auditioned and kept auditioning, and I finally got it. But funnily enough, the, the time I got it, I was in Singapore doing the musical Oliver, and the associate choreographer of Oliver is um, Jeffrey Garrett, who played Skimble Shanks in the 1998 uh, wow. TV, uh, video. And when he heard that I was auditioning, he said, great, let's work on the Cory. So he worked on the Cory with me, and that's the time I got the show. Uh, that's so fascinating to hear. I have two kind of follow-up questions, and um, I'll mm. hold the second one. I, I want to hear more about your family hating it, because I think that's... <laughs> Uh, it's such a polarizing thing because no, no, I no, no, not hating it, hating it. I hated it. Hey, but have you asked them the, on the why? Because I, I've yet to find anybody who's really hated it for a real reason besides it just being like, eh, it wasn't my thing. Yeah, I just think, uh, you know, and you hear it a lot, the story, you know, it's not too involved. But mm -hmm. as a kid, I ate that up. I got what was happening. I knew it was, I guess, simple enough for a kid to go, oh, great, they're coming together, then they're going to pick who's going to get this extra life and they're going to, a few cats are going to perform to see which one gets that life. So I was like, this is awesome to me. They would, I think they just thought it was a bit pointless. And yeah. But then when I did the show in Australia, I'm like, you're all coming. Like, I don't care if you don't like it or not. And they had a ball. They loved it. Okay, so that was going to be my next question was, now they have to come see you, right? You know, they can't mm. they can't ignore you. And did they, they turn? Was it because of you or was it because they have a different appreciation later? Look, I think a bit of, a, a bit of both. Like, um, sure. although they had, I have been in shows where they've been gone, no, nah, that was, I yeah. did not enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. I, I did Miss Saigon and they were, again, a whole heap of family came and they're like, it's so depressing. I'm like, yeah, it is depressing. It's, yeah. You know, based in the Vietnam War, it's like, and they went, we wanted more show numbers. Like, get over yourself. It's like, yeah. But I think because they knew how much I loved it and how much I I worked hard to get into it, and and I guess you know, telling them a bit more about what was going on and what to look for and who to look at, and don't just look at the story, but look at individual cats and see their trajectory throughout. Mm -hmm. That may not be, um, they may not get a song or they may not get a a solo, but every cat has a reason for being there and they've all got a personality. And that's what I found amazing with it. 
Yeah. And I mean, you were at, at one point were the twins. And so the twins yeah. kind of have this like, you know, eerie moment where they kind of catch it before. And that's something that I never picked up on until someone said it. And then as I watched it uh, again, it was like, oh, wow, they really do have the first turn or the first dance number in these pieces. So like, yeah. that's probably a part that your family never picked up on, I'm sure, until you cued them on it. Mm-hmm. No, and I and you know what? The first time I was, and I had seen Cats, I think maybe four times before I got into it, and I really didn't even know who the twins were until um, before the the production. Before I got into it, there was an Australian tent tour, and I saw that, and a friend of mine was Corrie Pat, and so I watched him. And I'm like, wow, they're crazy! Like they're, and it was so fun to play because they are. All the other cats are a little bit wary of them because they're they're weird they sense things that others don't they're a little bit like they would just stare at you much longer than what you'd feel comfortable yeah. um and they were they would move together it was awesome and it was so i had um two great tantamiles. miles um, one was siobhan ginty who was a close friend of mine and another one siobhan left and it was Catherine squire Squir- and both of us it was like both couples things we would just we loved trying to make it work that we were just one. Mm-hmm. And that's eerie as well. You know, it's different yeah. to Mungo and Rump, who they're always together, but they're individual. Uh, Corey and Tant, they're, they're, they're one. Yeah. My other question about seeing it at 11 is you're kind of right before you're going to recognize probably a lot of the sexual nature of the show. So do you oh, yeah. remember? Yeah, was it just completely over your head or did you – Pick up on P. Look, I mean, there's some that's obvious, I think, but there's a lot that's probably you're, not, you're missing the Demeter storyline probably at that point. You're missing absolutely a lot of absolutely. the ball pieces too. Yeah, yeah, like yes. Uh, I just thought Vicky was put into a nice list and everyone's yeah. going to sleep, and then like <laughs> then you come and do rehearsals and you're like, "We're what?" Uh, but yeah, I did. But I was also, you know, I was 11, so I was kind of becoming a little bit more aware of bodies and everything. So I thought it was hot. Like, I did think yeah. it was hot, but I didn't know the how um, obvious the – well, I guess not obvious for some, but, yeah, there was definitely a lot of – and cats. We would tell – like, we um, – Joanne Robinson was our associate, and she had put on – she had worked on the original in London, one of Gillian's assistants. She had put on all, um, all the Australasian productions up until the last one in 2015. I don't think she was done that. I think she kind of retired from it, but she was amazing. And, and she was like, you know, they are, they are sexual. They are slinky. They're sexy. And trying to find that in your body when you're used to being like this strong dancer. And yeah, you, you, you do do dances that are a bit slinky and sexy, but not this way. This was animalistic. This was, different and i loved all that yeah but i didn't get that when i watched it totally. i just went these guys are amazing yeah they're just dancing <laughs> they're just up there dancing it's fine it's they're yeah they're it's dancing in yeah. their cats <laughs> yeah so let's let's go into your production cats, the first yeah. one was um the south korea tent tour so yes, this was right. uh, in 2003 in your pounce of all yeah. this is I the was. tent tour that the tent essentially that you saw came with yeah. you to south korea right that's correct. Um, so in, when I was in Australia, it was called Cats Goes to the Circus, and they incorporated uh, circus things. They had um, a, a cloud swing. They had cats walking on a tightrope. And even though it, it, it kind of fit with the playfulness of cats, I, I thought when I saw it, it distracted from like the choreographer in the, in the Jellicle Ball, which like I love Gillian Lynn's choreography. And I found when all the good parts were happening, I was looking up at someone swinging on a glass mm-hmm. swing and I was like, oh. So that was, that was taken away when we um, did the South Korean tour. It was the same setup. The stage was the same, except our audience came around to the sides of the stage as um, well. And we had these um, like cats, pardon the pun, catwalk ramps that would go out into the audience either side of the stage um, that had tramps, trampolines in the in them that would open up. So when we came out of Siamese, because we did um, back then, Growl Tiger's uh, number was still going, we would jump onto the stage from the tramp. So, um, but yeah, it was the same tense. It was an experience that I don't need to live again. Like I love the show, yeah. but... Korea is either really hot or it's 
freezing cold and um you know we 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 could crawl from the the back of the set like where our change rooms and our warm up area was we could crawl under the stage to get to the front um to like the tubes and everything but you were there was one time the sewerage had broken and we were crawling over sewerage to get to our spots and we were like oh. this idiot and then, you know, in the winter, it would snow and, you know, we're in a likely unitard and yak hair for wigs. We'd be these catacles. It was cold. Yeah. you sweat either way. Like with that show, you just sweat either way. So it was interesting. It was, um, and I think in those sort of tours, and with, with cats especially, everyone, and I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay other casts that I've been in shows with, but with cats, you are, in your element, you are amongst other performers who are at their peak because you kind of have to be in that show. Um, so, and you're all experiencing the same thing. So we we really bonded. It was probably the, the, the show that I bonded the most with with Calf is Cat in, in the tent. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to hear you say that because it's like it feels like it's a show where every cast I've talked to, everybody that's in a production, one is they become, if they weren't obsessed with it before, they generally have like, at least for the most part, become a fan of like yeah. the experience and the show. But also it seems like you have to become really close to your castmates because you're also like rolling around on each other for oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the whole ball. So it's like, everyone just seems like everyone's super good friends. And that's like a, yeah. I, I don't know if that's always the way that happens. I mean, I always think back on sports and you become pretty good friends with a lot of your teammates when you play sports, but there's also probably one or two that you just, play you know the sport with but you don't get along with but you just figure it out it doesn't seem like that happens in cats um and it, i would really. assume it does in theater especially when you're on tour because in another country you're you're living in the same hotel as the cats, mm -hmm. so you're seeing them all the time you get one day off a week and basically those days because you're in a foreign country you're hanging out with those people anyway and yeah it's great and it is a family so, you know, you may have a moment where you just can't deal with one person and that's cool as long as you are up front with it. And yeah, it was awesome. It was so awesome. It was the best time. Both, both productions I did, um, the cast were great. Yeah, and so a lot of them were in that, the second production I did too. Yeah, so let's go to that one. So that's Australia and Asia. It yeah, was a tour it, that was kind of combined, right? Yeah, so it's, um, I rejoined and it was back in South Korea, but it was it was on... Uh, on the stage and um, when I rehearsed it there was probably about five of us that joined and I rehearsed as Clarica Pat <clears throat> they were rehearsing in the Korean creatives because once we left Seoul a Korean cast were going to take over the Charlotte Theatre in Seoul where we were and we were going to go on tour around Seoul um, so that was interesting. really interesting as well and then we actually got um to go back and see the Korean production while we were still on tour. And that was amazing because I don't understand Korean, but you still understand the show. And it was awesome. Yeah. They, were, they, were, they were an amazing cast too. And, um, you know, some of the, the, the songs in, in the show, Skimble especially, is very wordy and same with Peaks mm -hmm. and the Follicles. But to hear it in Korean, it's just like, how? How did they get those words out? It was amazing. But um, so, yeah, we started in Korea. And then, and then I think that what happened, uh, really useful, put on a stage production of High School Musical in Australia. And it was going to do this Australian um, tour. It opened in Sydney around the same time as the movie of High School Musical 2 came out. Mm -hmm. And everyone went to see the movie and no one came to see the show. So really useful had all these theatres booked. And we had time off in between Korea and China so it was about a, every time we moved to a different country we had about a month off so the set could get there so they brought us to brisbane where high school was supposed to be we did the show there because there was an australian set we uh cats we did the show there in brisbane for a month and then from there the general public were like when's it coming to melbourne when's it coming to sydney when's it so we went back to china and then found out that really useful we're going to bring us back after china and do an australian run so we did Australia then, and by then I was Skimble Shanks, and then we did Hong Kong, and then um, Kuala, uh, sorry Manila, and I busted my knee in Manila, and I left about a week after we opened. So that was about two and a half years I'd done Cat. Yeah, I did not know the High School Musical uh, 
yeah. backstory. That's kind of really interesting. Um, yeah. But I always, it's when I hear about international tours and national tours, it is, Cats is such a well-known entity, but also such a polarizing show that you have your family the first time that comes in and sees it as a group and was like, oh, hate it. And then you've got this other group that's obsessed and is going to come to every single production for a week at a time. What was the international reaction like in Manila and Hong Kong and everywhere else? So um, when we were in Manila, um, our Grisabella was, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Leia Salonga. She was the original Kim in Miss Saigon, and she was uh, the Princess Jasmine, the uh, singing voice in the animation of Aladdin. She's a huge star, like on the West End and Broadway, but she's from Manila. So when she would come on every two minutes or when she does, the crowd would go wild. They would just go off. And, I mean, she is amazing, and that's why. But um, And then in, in South Korea, um, we would have um, the head of the Cats fan club in South Korea. When we went to Busan, she would. She was based in Seoul. She would catch the fast train from Seoul to Busan, see the show. Then, because the fast train would end, she would have to catch an eight-hour bus back to Seoul overnight. Then go to work, and then she'd do it all again. So, a lot of the times, we'd be doing the show, and we'd look in the audience. She'd always get the front row, and she'd be asleep. <laughs> and we finish the show, and we're like, "What are you doing?" She goes, "I really, I really love the show." And we're like, that's awesome, but you've got you've got a Korean production in Seoul, and she's like, I like you guys. I'm like, oh, okay. wow. But we did have a lot of fans that would. We had a. a, a um, I don't want to sound like we're making fun of this guy, but we had a, a Korean fan, and we called him Wu Man, because during the bows at the end of the show, every cat that come out, he'd go woo, woo, <laughs> and we're like, oh, Wu Man's in, and. He, he didn't speak English, but he'd always come to, um, to stage door at the end of the show and he'd just say hi and he just, he was awesome. He brought his family once, his wife and two kids. They did not look like they were enjoying it, but he was, <laughs> he was having a ball. So the, um, excuse me, the, the Korean fans are, are amazing and beautiful. And actually one of them sent me during the pandemic, Melbourne, we were locked down forever. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I got this Insta- uh, message on Instagram saying, I think I've got a version of you. I think I've got you doing Skimble. I was like, no one's got me doing Skimble. Like, yeah. I, I had hardly, and that's the thing, being in theatre, you very rarely see yourself. But it's this, she taken a bootleg copy of the number, and I was like, oh, my God, it's me. And so I thought, that's awesome, because I never got to see it with me in it. Um so yeah, the Korean fans were awesome. Um, Australians love it. We only in Australia we'd only do each city about a month to six weeks um, mm-hmm. because it's been around so long. Um, but when we had, when we opened in Melbourne, I, um, we did a matinee, and then we opened on that night. And during the matinee, Melbourne had this torrential downpour of rain, and there's a part in the ball called Moonlight Hits where you all kind of look up and then you drop to the floor and then you do this thing called bullets where each cat has a number, a count, but they shoot their right hand up in the air. And I I shot my hand up and I felt this drip on my head. And I was like, first I thought, oh, someone sweated on me. It happens all the time in the show. You'd get yeah. someone sweat on you. And then I was, it was like drip, 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 drip. And I'm thinking, oh, no. And then our swings were on stage and we had – um, uh, rags that look like junk in the set. So if someone sweated, because we had the rake stage and it's a perspex stage, so mm-hmm. any form of moisture on there and you slide. So we had the swings kind of wiping up the floor and then all of a sudden stage management are throwing towels out there because it was like a waterfall <laughs> and we kept going. And we found out <laughs> at the end of the show, um, Mamma Mia and Jersey Boys were playing um, across from us and around the corner from us, they all had show stops, and they're not huge dance shows. <laughs> we danced through it and, and then we killed ourselves. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, look, we loved it. It's a hard show. Yeah. It's the hardest I've ever worked. Yeah, we'll be right back more to some crazy cats conversations after this short break. So. 
I want to pivot to backstories and mm-hmm. some of the like theories that you come up with because I think you know, especially when you're on tour, it seems like the the tour cast almost have more opportunity to come up with stuff because you're, as, like you said, you're hanging out and you're you're sitting there and you've got a new city and a new, um, you know, just a lot going on. But how would you explain like what what theories did you have to come up with or to really bring your three cats to life? Like was what did you add beyond what was told to you? Well, with Skimble, I always thought that um, Jelly, Jenny, Skimble and Grizz were kind of like the Sex in the City women when they were younger. Like they were, they would, they would hang out. They were really close. And so that was kind of my connection, my closest connections, I think. And my disappointment in Grizz when, you know, she kind of went off on her own and she was obviously the Samantha, like she. Yeah, and, I was say, can we you go obviously... through all of them? Who's, who's which four? <laughs> Grizz is Samantha. Um, Jelly is Carrie, but she's, okay. she's Carrie. Um, Jenny is um, Charlotte because she's the homemaker okay. and Skimble's um, Miranda because she's, he's fastidious. He's on, everything has to be on time and everything. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah, I had yeah. not. I have made the cats into a lot of TV shows and a lot of movies and a lot of things. I had not done Sex and, Sex and the City, so I, <laughs> that's really that's and it fits. It fits perfectly. Oh, good. <laughs> well, yeah. So <clears throat> that's how I think. But um, <clears throat> I mean, it wasn't them because I don't think Sex and the City was happening. But over the years, I've gone. They were, that's who they were. They were yeah. those girls. But um, also, I mean, Joe Joanne Robinson gave me. Because we had our three words, which I can't really remember. I think Skimble was fastidious, storyteller. I can't remember the third one. But um, she also told me that he enhances the story every year. Every year he tells a story and he makes himself a little bit more important. So I kind of played with that. And he kind of does that with um, Buster as well. He gets all the boys in line with Buster. He gets the hat for him to sit on and he cleans it all. He... He um he he almost um tries to make him sound sound a little bit more important than he is, and he's a drinker, so that probably helps him um tell his stories a little bit more colourfully because he loves his perhaps a what is it perhaps a spot of scotch. Um, I had I had not heard that. That's an interesting. I, I like I like that a lot. It, it fits. I've always heard Uncle Skimble. You know, like just yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was another thing. Yeah, you're you're the, you're the um, big gay uncle. I, I haven't heard the enhances the story every year. It, but mm. it, it like as I think about at least the choreography I know, which is in Julian, does Andy Blink of yours? Yeah. But it's all very much a. Let me tell you about my like. I get undressed and dressed, and it's like it's very mm-hmm. showy. Um, yeah. And so yeah, it does it does really like lend to that. I just had never thought of it from that way. And that's why um, the the kittens love Skimble telling the story, but they know what's happening, so that's why they kind of play up a little bit of it as well. He has to try to keep them in line, because but they also listening to see if he's going to change anything. He's going to yeah. make himself sound more important. So I had that, and she also gave me meerkat. Think of a meerkat. The the whole I don't know if you've seen. We used to have a TV show here called Meerkat Manor, and it was like a. National Geographic thing where there was cameras set up of this meerkat colony and they would just kind of stand to attention and look around, busybody. And I, I kind of felt that was Skimble. He was kind of saying, was there someone better? To, oh, is someone more important? And he would rush off to them like he'd mm, rush off to Old Jew. He'd rush off to um, Gus. So I kind of had him a bit like that. With Corey and Tance, as I said, as creepy as you could get it. Like, yeah. I don't think, yeah, I don't think we could, I think we, we had a connection to Monk because Monk used us as kind of his security. Um, so we were, we would make him aware when McCabot is coming, you know, we make him aware when old Jute's coming, we do that thing. I believe it is. Oh, do yeah. it um, and so he used us as our, as his security. Um, but everyone else, I don't think we really had much of a connection with because we were just too weird. Yeah, I um, I, I think there's so much to that story that's like not there but could be. It's like if I could write mm. a, a, a future storyline, I think like it'd be fun to kind of just tackle them. I oh, when I was with, yeah. yeah, when I was with the um the U.S. National Tour and I filmed for the hundredth, I actually gave I was giving plot points to uh 
to the cast to try on stage. I was like, let's try yeah. some new stuff tonight. And the one, the one I gave Mungo Jerry Rumpel teaser was, is I was like, you need to recruit the twins to be henchmen for you all. And like, like spies almost from McCavity's gang. And they told me the next day, they were like, they, the actors were so in character and so like staunch that they, they couldn't even get their attention yeah. to get them to yeah, like no. go. And I'm like, yeah, it's like they're, that's the role is that they're into but, the, yeah, I don't even think I don't think Corian's hand. I don't think they'd have either side really. I think they would help. They would help old Jude wholeheartedly, but they would do something nasty just because it would mess with people's brains as well. So I, I think actually didn't know if they would do it. I just I just thought it'd be fun to see if they could try. You know, like could you get them and use their powers for, for negative? You're a resident director's nightmare. You are. I, I know I am. Uh, I, well, I, I tried to pick only things that were, you know, things that aren't like, I'm not changing the story here. I'm not changing the plot. I'm trying to like with the yes, difference. You, you, don't want, you don't want Greece to get the extra life. You well, so I don't. I mean, the plot. yeah, I, well, I would like to change the plot. I would, I, I would like to, I still want to go on tour and just pick a different cat every night. With the, with the audience I think about. that's, I, I heard that on and I think that's an awesome idea. I think it'd be fun. It would definitely land. It would. Def- it would. I think it would work. Maybe it's too. It's too late now. There's forty plus years of this yeah. happening that like people have an expectation when they go see cats. But you know, early on, you could have done that. But I also like your idea that the next day they don't show up. Yeah, they don't come back. Yeah, you bring in another cat. That's awesome because you um. Everyone will be fighting to be that chosen person just to get an extra day off the next day. Uh, so you're thinking from the actor perspective. I'm thinking from the writing. I, what my idea would be like, no, 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 they come back and they're just like an un, they're the Peter or the Gilbert or the other like unnamed, you know, cat that does the the dan- dance in the beginning. So it's like you come back reborn, but you're just uh, an ensemble oh, dancer then. I but if you, yeah, because well, otherwise by the eighth show you're gonna be you're gonna be pretty short handed. If you don't let everybody come back, well, no, they they had the next day off, and then oh, just one they come day. back the day after. Okay, just one extra day. You only get one day off a week anyway. So yeah, you now, now you're really I, that's where bribes are really coming in. For it. I like that. I'm, now that. I'm for it. Now I'm getting an electric train. I'm going. Yeah, yeah. I'm building an electric train, <laughs> staging on it. Yeah, yeah. I, well, especially pre-pandemic. Yeah. You got to go out in the crowd a lot more. Yeah, you had the did. ability to do that. I was like, now you get to go out in the crowd and try to influence your voters. Oh, right. So the audience vote. Yeah, I want the audience to vote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, because otherwise, right. what, you want you still no, they're, hold they're your they're always to vote every day? They're always going to choose Tucker. Uh, I think you might get... I, it's a pretty wide range of different answers for everybody. I think Tugger would be up there. I think Mustafa would be up there. I think Skimble would be up there. Um, I don't think Gus, who gets the logical choice, be up there. No, I don't either. So it's you know what? I I'm, look. I'm not an ageist. I I I love the elderly. Some people think of me as the elderly, but I actually don't think Gus knows where he is. <laughs> I I, just... I think Jelly's just Jelly's gone. You're coming. I'm I'm taking you out, and she's actually nominated him because she wants him to get out of here so she can have some free time. Yeah, she wants so, her life that's back. What, she wants her life back. So I honestly don't think Gus even knows that he's at the Jellicle Ball. I, I I believe that. I like that. He's just yeah. rambling old stories and like you know, seeing old, old man. And that's why you see half the cast um, <laughs> when 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 it's a Growl Tiger kind of dispersed from the stage because they're getting changed into a. They like I was getting changed into a Rackish Crew pirate, but yeah, they leave because he's kind of boring. Yeah. I um I tell you the one that always gets me every time is Mungo Jerry and Rumpel teaser and then yeah. Bombi and Demeter and what I what I noticed and maybe this is just about my my own personal take as I saw it fairly recently again on stage and I was like oh those two numbers were amazing and I was like maybe it's because it's the only time I'm not grossly overwhelmed with the amount of dancing happening sure. it's the only time yeah. where there's just the two cats on stage yeah. for the most part. And so, but I think you're going to get different votes depending on the crowd. Uh, your woo man's going to not know how to vote. He's going to vote for everybody. No. no, yeah. But you, you're also you're also making everyone eligible to vote. Yeah, yeah. In the crowd. No, no, no. no. I mean, every every cat is yeah. eligible to. Ah, uh, right. I mean, I think you could narrow it down to the. I, at some point, if you're not a super fan, you're not going to know a couple of no. names. So you're and, and you're not going to. Yeah, you can have a write in. Just put a write in after you do the cats have the songs, and then you have a write in vote. So, in case someone wants to say, like, hey, I'm going to pick 
Tantamile, and most people aren't going to know. I guess they'll have the playbill, but like most people aren't going to know which cat Tantamile is if they're not true. familiar with the show. That is true. Um, okay. I would love to see that Tantamile gets picked and Cora Pat doesn't. See how that plays out. That'll be interesting. I Well, and my this all stemmed from seeing it with Leona Lewis from The X Factor, and they combine people all the time. So it's like, can uh, you vote two together? Could you vote the twins together? Uh, right, okay. Do you send Jelly yeah. and Gus? Do you send, you know, one or two? It gets interesting if someone picks like Bustifer, because then what happens? You know, like that's also Gus, right? I mean, nobody's picking yeah. Bustifer. I actually do have no, one Bustifer true. vote on this podcast. Um, oh, so there has been one vote, yeah. But it was because they the the argument was that he's a strain on resources, and so for the betterment of the tribe, if we got rid of him, we'll be better off. Which I, which was the argument. I'm like, all right, I could. That's not the fair. way I was thinking about it, but I could see that. Yeah, yeah, no, Gus, you mm, can get, get rid of him. And okay. I love the guy that played uh, Gus and um, and Buster at the same day. Oh, yeah. I was, at Pounceable, when I was Pounceable, I was always just being told to stop playing by the other cats because I was a kitten and I wanted to play. And when I was Corey and you just uh, staring evilly at someone, so you're not really listening, and Skimble, I went off halfway through to get into my pirate costume, so... Yeah, I've never did really you, connected to Gus. Did you um, treat Pounceful differently as Skimble later, having been Pounceful? Uh, well, see, um, when I was Pounce, Skimble was very protective of me, and I, I kind of felt that way towards him because Pounce is technically the youngest kit, male mm-hmm. kitten, um, so I was very protective of him. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't know when I was Skimble if the pounce was very close to Jelly, but I was also as pounce very close to Jelly. She, she was like a, I, I presume she was my mother, or she was at least the one that took care of me because I didn't have a collar, so I was a, I was a, um, I was not homed. Um, Corakback didn't have a collar either, so he wasn't home. He was a stray cat too, so. Um, but I mean, Corica and Tan can look after themselves, but Jelly really looked after me as Pounce and Skimble kind of wanted to sort of take care of all the little kittens. And he was yeah. a protector. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. I, I, fo- I follow it. It's, it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's just so interesting to think about like how the, like, does your own experience as one actually even influence yeah. it? Or what you're saying is more of the experience that you had from that, the actor who played it before with you is almost how it's like, oh, that's kind of how I had the reverse yeah. is how I took it into my production of that. No, I mean, Joe was very um, adamant that when a new cast came in to the production, and we had cast changes all the time, that they found their own way. So if they connected yeah. to someone else, they could go to somewhere else. And I know myself, when I became Skimble, I don't even think I noticed Kyrie and Tan. I don't even think we are on the same side of stage. The only times I noticed it um, at interval when we go out and play in the audience, the cue to come back on stage is when the twins come out on stage. So mm. call twins are out. And that's the only time I think. And and when they go, I believe it is old Deuteronomy. But, yeah, so it is kind of strange the connections you make. I mean, as Skimble, I was an adult, so I hung around with more of the adults. I protected the kittens, but as Pounceable, I was a kitten, so I wanted to play with Victoria and Syllabub and, and Tumble Brutus. And, um, but Tumble was kind of going into that teenage sort of, um, so it is interesting. Yeah. And it's well, I love hearing, Tan. I just want to play with Tan. Yeah. I love hearing you say that, that, that there is that freedom because that's kind of why yeah. I can, this exists. I mean, this podcast doesn't exist if there isn't that freedom because then there is no, like then it, different answers to different questions. Of exactly. This. If you don't yeah. have that freedom, it's, the same way every time and 40 years later, yeah. that's it. But I think that's also what makes it successful. Yeah, true. I mean, we, uh, Joe would also, in rehearsals, we would do between 30 and 45 minutes of um, uh, um, play, play as a cat in the room to discover these things. And yeah, at first we were like, oh my God, we have to. Like, my knee's tired from yesterday's rehearsal. But you'd go, it was really good. Oh, Funny, funny story, actually, when we got a new Grizz, and we had been doing the show for a while, but with this new Grizz came a couple of new kittens. <laughs> we would, Joe was setting remark, um, and when Grizz walks in, 
And she goes, she, she didn't really place it. And she just said, I want, she placed certain things where certain cats would come up, but she wanted to see what, what we did. And a lot of the new cats would come up and they'd be like, and swipe her and hiss at her. But the older cats, we'd go up and, and we'd sniff her. And we noticed that like, she smelled terrible. And we were like, oh God, this woman doesn't feel like she's had a shower. Anyway, anyway, at the end of that number and Grizz, uh, um, Delia Hannah, her name was, she, um, they did remark, but Joanne said, okay, so Pounceable, why did you hiss at her? And our new Pounceable was like, oh, because we don't like her. And she goes, mm, okay. Uh, Canamile, why did you, oh, because, you know, she, we've been told she's, can she went to, um, no, I must have been Corey at the time because uh, my mate who was Skimble said, Skimble, why did you hiss at her? And she goes, and he went, I really feel awful saying this, but she smells. And Dilly went, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. What Joe had done a week before rehearsal started was get a piece of raw meat and leave it out in the sun for a week and then put it in a plastic bag and perforate the bag and made her wear it. She was wearing a grizz coat in rehearsals under a grizz coat. So we would use our senses to smell and instead of just going, oh, I'm a cat, I'm going to hiss and claw. So this poor woman... <laughs> She's like, I do shower. It was the first time she met us. I do shower. I'm like, oh, wow. wow. That's, a, that's pretty cool. On. That, is, but we uh, also, that is some we interest, all, That is some interesting directing of like, I'm going to. Hold on, yeah. Yeah. It's awesome, though. We also, yeah. we never got a rehearsal tale. Um, we only got it on the last day of rehearsal. And we had to bring our perfume or our cologne in. And we had to give it to stage management. They'd number it. And then at lunch, we'd go out, they would spray a rehearsal tail with your cologne and then they'd hide it. And when we came back as a cat, you had to find it. You had to match the smell and you could go up to another cat and sniff them and try to find theirs. And if you found it, you took it to stage management and they would tell you whether it was yours or not. So that's how you got your tail. Wow. That is, so I, was, I mean, so interesting to hear because it's like the idea is to try to get you into character as, as, <coughs> much yeah. as possible yeah. and it's or i guess cat cat, cat character yeah yeah because mm -hmm. and joe said joe said the first day of rehearsals this is not a dance show if you think this is a dance show you've lost the point it's an acting show you need to be a feline for two and a half hours mm -hmm. you cannot stand up straight you can't sit on your bum you have to you have to you have to learn especially if you're a stand-up cat how to go from crawling to standing in a feline way so she was amazing. Joe's, Joe's amazing. She knew that show inside and out and knew how to yeah. get great performances out of this. But that's awesome. Yeah, poor Delia. Yeah. So let's <laughs> yeah. do some rapid fire. Um, okay. If you could go on for any cat for one night, forget whether you're mm -hmm. capable, male, female. If you had one night on, on stage, who would you want to go on as? It's either two, and it's either Vicky or Cassandra. A, I would love to be able to take my leg and hold it up there like Vicky does. <laughs> But also anyone who can go on stage in either a white unitard or Cassandra has no fur and just be, have that body to look good. Yeah. Like as a skimble, I had a vest. I had arm warmers, leg warmers. I was covered up and Pounce and Corey as well. But those two girls, like their bodies were awesome and I would love to look like that. I didn't, yeah. didn't even have to do the show. But, yeah, probably those two. Um I love. I went on for Mungo quite a bit. I love playing Mungo. That was fun because awesome. he's cheeky and yeah. It, and it was and it was while I was playing Corrick Bat, so it was a different pairing. Yeah. To be more playful than I mean, I loved my tants and we had fun, but to be on as Mungo with Rump and just cause trouble, it was great. So yeah. probably, if it wasn't those two, it would be Mungo. Who are your favorite and least favorite cats in the show? Um, I know I sound biased, but I love Skimble. I do love Skimble. Um, I, I always had loved Skimble. I just thought he was fun and I, I loved the number. Um, least favorite is Bustafa. Yeah. Common answer. I mean, yeah, get rid of him. Yeah, he's, well, he, he has been in the Royal Caribbean oh. Cruise 90 minute version. He's one of the ones cut. Well done, Royal Caribbean. No, yeah. Um, yeah. And as I said, our, our Bustafa Gus, Grau Tiger, both of the two that I had were both amazing. But then yeah, faster fast look. Yeah. Even the number, like the number itself, I was like, oh, every time it come on. 
Okay. Uh, what's your uh, favorite song from the show? Um, I I loved Old Deuteronomy. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I I went on the tugger once. Terrible. It was um, I was like the fifth emergency to go on, but we were desperate. Uh, I'm only five foot eight. So when you put that big cowl and the wig on, my resident director, uh, Stephen Morganti, said, you look like the butchest cat because I, <laughs> I, I kind of look like this nugget of a, of a thing. And, but you got to sing Old Deuteronomy with Monk. Um, so I loved Old Deuteronomy. I mean, I love singing the symbol, but I did love Old Deuteronomy, I think. Mm-hmm. So this is my fun question is, you know, you got to do it in a circus tent, yeah. basically. Which cat do you think would be the best, like, circus ringleader? Ringleader? Or, yeah, would it, like, run the circus. Who would be yeah. Who would be best in charge? Uh, in charge. Um, well, uh, this is stereotypical, but usually, you know, you'd see more in the movies that the ringleaders are all a bit dodgy. I think McCavity. Oh, interesting. I was thinking, uh, he, maybe I think he wouldn't personality pay, he wouldn't pay the, Yeah, he, I see oh, where you're going with it. Okay. Yeah, he wouldn't pay the performers. They'd live in squalor, but he'd make all the money. So I'd say McCavity. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, okay, we've got the important question here. I know you got to take, but I've argued at length. I don't think it's Grizabella. So who's your jellical yeah. choice? And I want to know the Skimble answer, and I want to know the Darren answer. Skimble is Skimble. Like, of course, he thinks yeah. it's Skimble. Um, but it's not him. It's not him. Um, look, I think it's Grizz, but it, only for the reason that I think old Jute feels that he's lost control of the tribe. They're all very judgmental. All their numbers talk about themselves and about how good they are. Um, and they need a bit of humility and they need, and I think that's where he, he's brought, he's brought, um, Grizz in. He's the one that's, gone i think this this cat can change the mindset of this cloud of cats and um so you know she she may not be the most worthy but i think she's the one that's going to teach us Mm -hmm. a lesson um and that's why i as i said i don't i think with gus like i can see why people say gus because he's old and he's sweet but he he's i think locked in his um memory of what how, what a good life he, he has had. And I think to take that away for him to start all over again, I, I, I think that's, um, I think that's kind of cruel because he loves thinking about when he was Grout Tiger and when he, um, fought Fire Throw Fiddle, the theme from the bell. Um, he loved all that. Um, Dick Whittington's cat and all that. He loves all those memories. And I think to take that away from, for him when he's so cared for is a bit mean. To give it to Grizz, who she's not part of the group anymore. She really isn't. And I think if if I've heard on your podcast that you've said, you know, why can't she stay here now that she's been accepted? I, if I was Grizz, I wouldn't want to, no. knowing that these people who now have accepted me are like, oh, you sang this sweet song. We will let you back in. I'd be like, screw you. I don't want to come back. I just wanted to make you see what creeps you all were. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting take because that was going to be my next question to you, which is I, I, I don't disagree with the lesson or the redemption arc. I think those are very real. And that's why yeah. the redemption arc, I think the redemption arc is she stays. She does get to kind of hang out. The lesson, like teaching lesson, I guess my question would be is does a choice have to be made every year? Because no, you can teach a lesson by yeah. not picking anybody. And I reckon if none of us turned around at the end of memory, there'd be no choice. No choice. Okay. Yeah. No, so I'm now well, at the point where no choice is better than Grizabella. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> or he would have just said, screw you all. It's going to be Grizz and there'll be no ball next year. Yeah. Oh, one year he's got to pick himself. So maybe that's uh, no, I don't. I don't think he can. I think he's like, um, I think he was born into it. I think he's, could we treat him like royalty? Mm-hmm. And it's same with Monk. I think Monk, one of, I, I could be wrong, but I'm, I think one of Monk's word, three words was princely because I think he is part of that lineage. That does, w- w- doesn't he want his time? Uh, who, what do you mean? Like, I, I, I think, like, my only argument is, so I, I, I agree that you could say Old Deuteronomy does this for eternity, but the way they portray Monk is, is that he is 
stepping up to do this at some point. He's being like oh, no, no. groomed to do it. And yeah. if he's being groomed oh. to do it and Old Deuteronomy's never gone anywhere, it almost seems cruel. No, no, no. Old Deuteronomy is going to die. But he's oh, going to so go he's, straight. Okay. So he's just going to die one day. He's not going to go. He to, will to, die. No, yeah, no uh, jellical choice. No heavy side layer. Just out no, and one uh, takes over. Yeah. Because I think he, where he's going, because he's on a higher plane to everyone else. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they do it in the, the new, um, the new version, but at the start of um, Moments of Happiness, the start of Act 2, mm-hmm. when um, so everyone after we played in the audience would come back on stage and he starts singing and at certain points you'd see the cats, they'd kind of, you could see kind of them, their bodies kind of moving around and that was him sending him sending um, messages to us through the floor and that mm-hmm. and we're sort of receiving it and that's what happens when he he made, uh, he made um, Cory Kari Kapat kind of lift his arm and then Tants put her paw into his paw and then she passes it on to Silabub who sings, uh, does she sing moon, Moonlight? Um, so he's he's above everyone else. So he's going okay. to a higher plane wherever he is. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, he's ethereal, I think. Yeah, I... I, I like your, I like the, I've always liked the teaching the lesson because I do, I've, I've gone back to, is he making a choice every year? Is it the same decision-making criteria every year? Is it kind of on a whim? And it sounds like this was a year based on like Grisabella. It's like, no, he's got to teach a lesson. He's got to have a redemption. We've got to have this like acceptance piece back. But yeah. I still, still feel like it seems a little cruel to send her out after this like arc of bringing her back. What homeless woman hurt you in a previous life? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I, the, yeah, it's all. It's also too. It's like you know, I, I, I said when I saw it recently, I was just like, ah, the Grisabelle was so good, and I was like, why does your performers have to be so good? Because <laughs> yeah. I've spent so long arguing against you, and then I get to hear you sing memory, and I'm like, ah, that is so powerful it, and so well done. And they cast the Gris quite young now, don't they? They do, and I think that's part of where. Long. Yeah, and I think that's maybe where I like some of my also like they should stay comes from is because they're all, you know, they're so younger, young. and so it's like it seems almost cool that she's had this like beat. I, I've I've called her like the the bald Britney Spears age where she's not that old. She's come back. <laughs> she's now having this like let her have her resurgence. <laughs> well, the last production in Australia, um, they had a. a, a Pop star here, Delta Goodrum, she played. So, and, and I know they had her young. They also had the rap tugger in that production. The rap tugger. Um, by the time this one comes out, I have talked to one and I have gotten all my answer, questions answered, um, which I will tell you the about Aussie, when we hang up. The Aussie one? So, uh, yes, the Aussie one. Oh, yeah, okay. He's, he's so, awesome. Uh, yes. So I finally got, finally got that uh, box checked for this, for this podcast. Oh, fantastic. I've been trying for, for ages. Um, well, this has been so fun. I really appreciate you sharing your stories and theories. I love the Sex and City. That's a great <laughs> combination I hadn't thought about, which is fun because now I've got another show to 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 compare cats to. Um, but yeah, how can people stay in touch with you? Uh, I guess on Instagram, I'm at Darren underscore A underscore Tyler. It's very boring, I know, but uh, I'm not doing a show at the moment. But if and when I do. I'm kind of semi-retired of the dancing. I decided last year I was getting too old, but um, I still want to audition for shows. So you can keep, um, yeah, see what I do on that. I sometimes post. Amazing. Mm. Yeah, amazing. Well, this has been amazing. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's been a great, great time. And thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast atrophy. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at The Wrong Cat Died, or check out our website, thewrongcatdied.com. <laughs>